Greetings to all Christians around the world. Another Bible reflection entitled Pre-Tribulation Rapture. The rapture was promised by the Lord Jesus Christ just before His crucifixion. John 14, 1-3 At the rapture, He kept His promises and fulfills the prophecy. The rapture completes the redemption of the body because the believer receives a resurrection body at that time. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21, 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. It would be useful at this point to read the description of the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 53 and then to know the comments below concerning the terminology used. The word mystery, a doctrine hidden from the Old Testament saints, the rapture is pertinent, is pertinent only to the church age and was never revealed to believers living before the beginning of the church age. The word we shall not all sleep, that is there will be some believers alive at the time of the rapture. The, the phrase, we shall be changed, refers to the resurrection body. The phrase, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, a reference to the time element. The rapture is not a long, drawn-out process of evacuation. It will be with Christ instantly. The phrase, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, means the resurrection body does not include the decay and corruption of sin and death. The phrase, we shall all be changed, another reference to the new physical body and new personal attributes associated with, with the resurrection body. The phrase, this incorruptible must put on, on incorruption. The most important feature of the resurrection body is that there will be no sin nature. The phrase, this mortal must put on immortality, means the believer will not die but will receive an immortal body. The dead in Christ, believers who have died previous to the rapture will be raised first, then those who are still alive will be taken up. Philippians chapter 4 verses 16 and 17. The rapture is a rendezvous for living and dead Christians. Confidence in the rapture is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 18. In the principle of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the first fruit of the believer as noted in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 to 23 the phrase fair fruits first fruits pictures the resurrection of Christ which is a guarantee of our bodily resurrection the phrase by man came death to Adam came spiritual death with the, with the end result of physical death for every human the phrase by man came also the resurrection by Jesus Christ is in his humanity came a spiritual resurrection or salvation followed by physical resurrection Philippians 3 21 rapture when used in eschatological terms is an English word used in place of the Latin word raptus taken from the Vulgate which is in turn is a translation of the Koine Greek word harpazo, which is found in the Greek New Testament manuscript of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. In many modern English translations of the Bible, harpazo is translated caught up or taken away. Harpazo, Koine Greek, forcibly snatched away, taken for oneself. There are 50 evidences for the tribulation rapture. 1. The early church believed in the imminency of the Lord's return. While it can be debated which church father said what, there is a consisten consistency in the early church or eminence on eminency which is essential to the three 
pre-tribute position and in a position and in opposition to some other positions. Second, the pre-trib position is the only one which truly teaches eminency. Third, the fact that there is a greater development of the doctrine in recent centuries does not preclude it from the early centuries. In the very early years of the church, you see the development of great fundamental doctrines of Trinity, deity, dead man, canon of scripture, etc. Following those early church concepts is a time of decline in the corporate church into great apostasy. The teaching of that time are built on many of the heresies of Augustine. When the Reformation comes, there is a period of reestablishing the foundational doctrines of salvation. Now, in these days, there is both an ability and a need in the church to better understand the doctrines of eschatology and the Spirit is continuing his ministry of guiding the church in all truth. Fourth, the exhortation to be comforted by the coming of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4.18, is valid only in the context of the pre trib view. It could even be a fearsome thing in a post trib view. Five, we are exhorted to look for the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. If there are any prophetic events that this tribulation to come first, then this passage is nonsensical. Six, Again, we are to purify ourselves in view of His coming. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. If His coming is not imminent, then the passage is meaningless. 7. The church told only to look for the coming of Christ. It is Israel and the tribulation saints that are told to look for signs. 8. The translation of the church is never mentioned in any context dealing with the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. 9. The church is not appointed to wrath. Romans chapter 5 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 9 to 10. The church cannot enter into the great day of the wrath. 10. The church will not be overtaken by the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 to 9. The day of the Lord is another term for the great tribulation. 10. 11. The church will be kept from the hour of this thing that shall come upon all the world. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. 12. The believer will escape the tribulation. Luke 21, 36. 13. It is in the character of God to deliver His own from the greatest times of trial. Lot, Rahab, Israel, and Noah. 14. It is clear that there is a time interval between the translation of the church and the return of Christ. John 14.3 15. Only the, the pre trip position does not divide the body of Christ on a works principle as does partial rapture does so clearly and others to a lesser extent. It becomes a climatic final to the grand plan of salvation by grace alone. 16. The scriptures are adamant that the church is undivided. In this age, the church is divided by the continuing old nature and the believers. When we are glorified at the coming of Christ, the church is no more divided. 17. The godly remnant of the tribulation has the attributes seen in Old Testament Israel and not the church. The church is not present in the prophecies of Revelation. 18. The pre-tribulation view, unlike the post-tribulation view, does not confuse terms like elect and saints, which apply to believers of all ages, as opposed to terms like church and in Christ, which apply only to those who are, and who are the body of Christ in this age. 19. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer of evil in the world. He cannot be taken out as prophesied unless the church, which is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, is taken out. 20. The Holy Spirit will be taken out before the lowliest one is revealed. The lowliest one will certainly be revealed in the tribulation. In fact, the tribulation begins with the signing of the covenant between the lowliest one and Israel. That act will reveal him. 21. 
The falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 would better be understood in its context as the departure. This is a reference to the departure of the Holy Spirit as He indwells the church. 22. The work of the Holy Spirit making the church like Christ where they submit to death and persecution, whereas the Old Testament change and the tribulation change cry out for vengeance. Revelation 6.10 23. Only the pre-tribulation view allows for a truly literal interpretation in all of the Old Testament and New Testament passages regarding the, tree, the Great Tribulation. 24. Only the pre-tribulation position clearly distinguishes the Church and Israel and God's dealing with each. With each. That the necessity of an interval of time between the rapture and the second coming. 25. All believers must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. This event is never mentioned in the account of events surrounding the second coming. 26. The four and twenty elders in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 to 5 and chapter 14 are, represented, are representative of the church. Therefore, it is necessary that the church undivided be brought to glory before those events of that tribulation. 27. This is clearly a coming of Christ for his bride before the second coming to earth. Revelation 19, 1, 7 to 10. 28. Tribulation chains are not translated at the second coming of Christ, but carry on ordinary activities. This is specifically include farming, construction, and giving birth. Isaiah 65, 20 to 25. The judgment of the Gentile nations following the second coming, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, indicates that both the saved and the lost are in a natural body, which would be impossible if the translation had taken place at the second coming. 30. If the translation took place at the same time as the second coming, there would be no need to separating the sheep from the goats at the subsequent judgment. The act of this translation would be the separation. 31. The judgment of Israel, Ezekiel 20, 34 to 38, occurs after the second coming and requires a regathered Israel. Again, the separation of the saved and the lost would be unnecessary if all the saved had previously been separated by translation and at the second coming. 32. At the rapture, the church meets Christ in the air. At the second coming, Christ returns to the Mount of Olives. 33. At the time of the rapture, the Mount of Olives is unchanged. At the second coming, it is divided, for forming a valley east of, Jer of Jerusalem. 34. At the time of the rapture, saints are translated. No, no saints are, are translated at the time of the second coming. 35. At the time of the rapture, the world is not judged for sin, but, dis but descends deeper into sin. At the second coming, the world is judged by the King of Kings. 36. The, trans the translation of the church is pictured as a deliverance from the day of wrath, whereas the coming of Christ is a deliverance for those who have suffered under severe tribulation. 37. The rapture is, imminent, is imminent, whereas there are specific signs which precedes the second coming. 38. The translations of living believers is a truth revealed only in the New Testament. The second coming with the events surrounding it is a prominent in both Old Testament and New Testament. 39. The rapture is only for the saved, while the tribulation and second coming deals with the entire world. 40. No unfulfilled prophecy stands between the church and the rapture. Many signs must be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ. 41. No passage in either Old Testament or New Testament deals with the resurrection of the saints at the second coming, nor mention the translation of living saints at that, at that the same time. Forty-two. Only the pre-tribulation view maintains the distinction between the Great Tribulation and the Tribulation in general which we all experience. 43. The Great Tribulation is properly understood in the pre-tribulation view as, an, as a preparation for the restoration of Israel. Deuteronomy 4.29-30, Jeremiah 34-11, Daniel 9.24-27, Daniel 12.1-2. 44. 
Not one single passage in the Old Testament which discusses the tribulation mentioned in the church. 45. Not one single passage in the New Testament which discusses the tribulation mentions the church. 46. In contrast to mid-tribulation or pre-wrath views, the pre-tribulation view offers an adequate explanation for the beginning of the, of the Great Tribulation in Revelation chapter 6. These other are clearly refuted by the plain teaching of Scripture that the Great Tribulation begins long before the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11. 47. There is no proper groundwork provided that the seventh trumpet of Revelation is the last trumpet of 1 Corinthians 15. It is accepted only on the basis of assumption. The pre the view maintains the proper distinction between prophetic trumpets of the church and the trumpets of the tribulation. 48. The unity of Daniel's 70th week is maintained by the pre-tribulation view. They contrast the mid-tribulation view destroys the unity and confuses the program for Israel and the church. The post-tribulation view usually denies the clear teaching of the 70th week by, by, by subverting it into some form or another of allegory. 49. The gathering of saints after the tribulation is done by angels, whereas the gathering of the church is done by the Lord Himself. 50. Revelation 20, 22, 17 to 20. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And he that heareth, let, let him say, Come. He who testify of these things said, Yes, I come quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. There are more reasons for the rapture. The rapture is a very important promise in the, in the chronology of end-time events. It must be properly understood if we wish to be ready and worth it to escape the coming tribulation period. During the rapture, true Christians will disappear from the earth in the twinkling of an eye. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an, an archangel, and, the, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we have, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. By the way of the rapture, the Lord will, not, will snatch away his disciples for whom he has gone to prepare a place in heaven. The harvest of souls from the kingdom of God for the kingdom of God will then be gathered in heaven. These are various biblical reasons why this there must be and and uh, consequently will be a rapture of the of believers at the end of the church dispensation. It marks the end of the church age. The rapture normally ends the dispensation of the church on earth as the members of the true church will then be removed from earth and taken to heaven. Only the backsliders, the nominal believers, the members of the deluded and dead Christian churches, as well as all the followers of false religions will remain behind, behind on earth. The people who do not turn to Christ then to be saved will join the, de the deceived masses who will enter into a covenant with a false messiah or antichrist to worship and follow him. The signs of the times indicate that we are at present very close to the end of the church dispensation. The Bible describes this time as a, as a period of great falling away from the truth and also of intensified demonic activities. Satan is lulling certain churches into a deep spiritual sleep while occupying the attention of others with deceptive signs and wonders performed by false prophets. At the same time, the coming anti-Christian dispensation, all-inclusive ideology of universal or cosmic unity, holism or monism, is actively pro propagated. Structures are also created for the world government, world religions, and world economy of the Antichrist. It is not without reason that the Lord Jesus urges us to stand firm against the deception of the last days and to watch and pray always that we may be found worthy to escape the coming tribulation period. Luke chapter 21 verse 36. More reasons for the rapture. It is important to consider the rapture in its dispensational context. That is at the end of the church 
age and just before the beginning of the tribulation period. Within this perspective, we should resist the moral collapse and the spiritual falling away that are typical of the last days of the church dispensation while also opposing the reforms aimed at promoting the global governance and ecumenical alliance of world religions that will allow the Antichrist and the false prophet the opportunity to gain control over the world and to institute the new world order. We are dispensationally in a terminal situation in which most people sadly grow cold in their love toward Christ while the unrighteousness is increasing due to an emerging international culture of sin. We should actively denounce this trend as well as the globalizing reforms aimed at, in, at instituting the next dispensation. In time like this, preaching about the expected rapture is critically important. We are like long distance runners to, who hear the bell ringing to announce the last round of the race. This message motivates us not to relax but to, preserve, to persevere to the end. Peter says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? 2 Peter 3, 11-12 We should not lose perspective and start compromising under the pressure of a rapidly changing world, but keep on fighting the good fight of faith while resisting all, all forms of evil. Another reason it affords the Antichrist the opportunity to be revealed. The rapture is directly related to the revelation of the Antichrist. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only who, who are now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed when whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deceptions among those who perish because they did not receive, receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 6 to 10. The true church of Christ indwelt by the Holy Spirit is withholding the Antichrist who can clearly only be revealed after the church has been taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit in, in the church is stronger than the spirit of error that is operating in the evil world to deceive people. When the true church is suddenly taken away, the light of the world will vanish and the hour of complete spiritual darkness will take effect. Under these circumstances, the man of sin will be evil to reveal himself without any opposition. The rapture has to occur before he can be revealed. To prepare people to be ready for the rapture calls for a spiritual disposition of absolute loyalty to the true Christ and also the unqualified rejection of the false cosmic Christ of all faiths. Another reason, it is a strong motivation for steadfastness in a time of backsliding. The coming of the heavenly bridegroom will occur during a time of religious compromise and worldliness. There will be a great falling away from the truth of God's word. A relatively small group of evangelical Christians will shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Philippians chapter 2, 2 verse 15 As in times of Noah and Lot, the earth will be filled with violence materialism and sexual perversion. Unfortunately, the spirit of unrighteousness and immorality will also take its toll among Christians. They will relax their vigilance and make downward adjustment in their spiritual standards. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew 24, 12 Many Christians will keep such a low profile that the ultimate lapse into complete passivity, spiritual sleep. Jesus, Jesus warned his followers against this phenomenon and emphasized the expectations of his sudden coming as a strong motivation for steadfastness. Mark 13:35 to 37 it says, 
Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at night, at the crowning of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly be he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Inactive Christians are obviously not strongly dedicated to the Lord, and they have a tendency to grow cold in their love towards Him. The process of, of growing cold manifests in two ways. Firstly, they develop a love for the world and worldly parties where they eat and drink to accept to chest. Second, anxiety and depression take root in their minds and also cold them down spiritually. Again, this kind of waywardness, the Lord Jesus warned His disciples and again offered them rapture as a positive motivating force to remain steadfast to the end. Luke 21, 34-36 says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and the day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come to as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Another reason for the rapture, it is an escape from the disaster area of divine judgment. The rapture also can constitute a dramatic rescue operation in which the true believers are removed from the scene of divine judgment. Although the rapture is a unique occurrence, there are examples in the Bible of times when God poured out His wrath, but provided an escape route to the true believers as they were not the, the objects of His wrath. In the time of Noah, God announced His judgment upon a wicked and perverted generation. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Mark yourself an ark. Genesis, Genesis 6, 13-14 Shortly before the commencement of the judgment, the eight believers escaped the disaster area by entering the ark. God himself closed the door behind them before he judged the sinners. Genesis 6, 16-23 In the time of Lot, the believers were also rescued. The night before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were ordered to evacuate the city and flee to the mountain. The angels emphasized the fact that they could do nothing as long as Lot and his family were still among the wicked. Fire and brimstone rained down from the heavens shortly after their departure. Their departure. The cities were, with all their inheritance, inhabitants were destroyed. Genesis 19, 13-25 The Bible says that there is a clear correlation between this historic event and God's in time dealing with believers and unbelievers. Luke 17, 26 to 30, and also Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 19. People who are cynical about the promise of the rapture and do not heed the admonition to be prepared to escape the coming tribulation period reveal a very reckless attitude. What do you think would have happened to the believers and the, and the entire human race if Noah argued as follows, God is a God of love, and I don't really believe that He will send a flood to judge all people. Therefore, I am not going to build an ark to escape the so-called judgment. Or what would have happened to Lot and his family if he took the following stand? I think the prophesied judgment over Sodom and Gomorrah should be interpreted symbolically. I don't have to escape from my life. Even if the disaster does occur, I believe that God will protect us from His wrath here in this place. The coming judgment during the tribulation period are ir irrefutable biblical facts. Jesus said, There will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world. Matthew 24, 21, and that we should be ready to escape. To escape it. Luke 21, 36. Another reason for the rapture it is a direct intervention by God. The supernatural nature of the rapture in which millions of Christians will be caught up in the air will be so clearly an intervention by God that no scientific explanation can ever account for this astounding phenomenon. There might be a few absurd explanations which, as in the case of the evolution theory, 
will only be accepted by those whose minds have been blinded by the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It is only an almighty God who can resurrect and change millions of Christians in a single moment and cut them away from planet Earth. He will take away his own while the others will be left behind. The hand of the Lord will also unmistakably be seen in the judgment that will be poured out over a degenerate humanity after the rapture. The dramatic effect of the rapture as well as the severity of the apocalyptic judgment that will follow in its wake will be a clear message to a multi-religious and apostate humanity that their only hope is in returning to the triune God and, and His inherent word. The rapture will also utterly refute the spiritualization theology in which many of the plain biblical statements are spiritualized and thereby deprived of their literal meaning. In this way, liberal theologians have, dis have disposed of many of the precious promises and dire warnings in the Bible by alleging that they are merely to be regarded as symbolic or allegorical expressions. After the rapture, millions of people will continue to harden their hearts. As a result of this attitude, they will receive a spirit of delusion which will induce them to believe the lies of the Antichrist. See Cantisolonians 2, 11-12. However, there will also be many people who will have a new appreciation for the Word of God. They will seek the Lord and call upon His name, regardless of the consequences of Christian worship in a Christ-rejecting new world order. Another reason, it is associated with the first resurrections. The rapture is directly related to the first resurrection when all the believers will glorified, will get glorified resurrection bodies. Millions of those who are going to be caught away are already dead. Consequently, they must first be raised from the dead in, in incorruptible glorified bodies, like unto Christ's glorious body. At the, at the same moment, the, moral, the mortal bodies of the living believers will be miraculously changed into glorified bodies while they pass from mortality to immortality without dying. Paul explained this promise to a Christian congregation as follows, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all asleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a, twinkle, in, a, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verses 51 to 53. To the Philippians he said, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. The first resurrection is also referred to as the resurrection of the just. Luke 14, 14, as well as the resurrection of life. John 5, 29. These people are indeed blessed to, the, to be partakers of the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has passed in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but, this, but they shall be pressed of God of, and of Christ and shall reign with Him in a thousand years. Revelation 26 The godless will have no part in the first resurrection, the rapture, and the millennial reign of Christ. That is why John says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 25 They will be raised during the second resurrection, which is also called the resurrection of condemnation John 5:29 More reason it separates true and nominal Christians apart from the division that the rapture will, will affect between the saved and unsaved people in the world it will it will also separate the true believers from the nominal Christians within the church those who only have a form of godliness will be left behind this faith will befall them despite the fact that they may have regarded themselves as members of the Church of Christ, like the foolish virgins also did. Only, the, the, only after the rapture will many of them discover the absence of the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Although they can still put matters straight then, the bridegroom will not open the door to them by way of a second rapture, much as they may desire it and urgently knock on heaven's door. They will have to remain outside in the cold, face the dark days of the tribulation, 
and be prepared to die as martyrs for their faith. How many millions of Christians indeed find themselves in, the, in this category of self-deceived and unsaved church members who trust in the deed form of godliness? They argue that since they are baptized and confirmed in the church, they have entered into an eternal and irrevocable covenant with God. In the light of this perception, they feel quite comfortable even though they don't have a clear testimony of being saved and born again through true repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 it, it is only the regenerating work of the Lord that can save your soul. Be sure that you are not weighted in God's balance at the time of the rapture and found wanting that you will be left behind when the Lord Jesus takes away his bride. Matthew 25.10-13 Another reason for the rapture? It is a meeting with Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus comes back to earth, He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the, with the voice of an, of, an, of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Those who died in Christ will be raised from the dead, while the living saints will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Together they will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The greatest expectations with regard to the rapture is not just to get away from earth, but to arrive in heaven with the Lord. The longing bride wishes to be united with her heavenly bridegroom. People who don't believe in the rapture must ask themselves how else, other than by the rapture, can they, can be, can they be caught up from earth and divinely moved to the glorious presence of the Lord Jesus in heaven? The Christians will be caught up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. After his earthly ministry, Jesus was bodily caught up to heaven, Revelation 25. Paul was caught up to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. In all these cases, the same verb that is catch up uh, in Greek word harpatsu is used, which means rapture. On this occasion, the heavenly bridegroom will not appear in public as he will at his appearing at the end of the tribulation. When every eye shall see him, Revelation 1 7, he will come secretly like a thief in the night to snatch away his bride. From the viewpoint of the world, she will suddenly disappear without a trace. She will then be a heavenly place, places in the divine presence of King of Kings. Another reason more, it is a summons to appear before the judgment set of Christ. To be well prepared for the rapture with a view to the destination of the bride at the end of the journey involves preparations for certain commitment. Only of them is to appear, one of them is to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The prospect of the rapture clearly confront us with the responsibility to give account to Christ of our lives after conversion, Paul says, for we must appear, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God, Romans 14.10. The Lord Jesus said, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Revelation 22, 12. We must never think about the rapture in isolation as only a journey to heaven. It is a means to a wonderful end. We know why we will be removed from the, from the impending disaster area of divine judgment on earth. But we also need to be thoroughly prepared for what is awaiting us at the end of the journey in heaven. The very first appointment that we have after meeting the Lord Jesus in the air is to appear before His judgment set. Since only Christians will be caught away during the rapture, only Christians will appear before the judgment seat where the works will be tested. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is led, which is Christ Jesus. Not, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one work will become manifest. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will teach each one work of what sort it is. If anyone's work while he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loose, but he himself will be saved, yet so as to fire. 1 Corinthians 3, 11-15 we are not saved by works, but by faith. 
However, faith without work is dead. In the lives of Christians, a true faith will produce works that befit repentance. For these works of the dedication which are done by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, the words of grace will be given at the, ju the judgment seat of Christ. On that day, it will be evident that some Christians were much more productive in the work of the Lord, having used their talent to their full potential. Others will be found to have been least productive, and yet others will stand there empty-handed. Save us through fire. The following five crowns will be awarded to Christians in the service of the Lord. The imperishable, the imperishable crown for a holy, dedicated life. 1 Corinthians 9, 24-25. The crown of rejoicing for people who had led others to Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. The crown of glory for faithful pastors. 1 Peter 5, 2, 4. The crown of life for Christian martyrs. Revelation 2, 10. The crown of righteousness for those who love is coming. 2 Timothy 4, 8. More reason for the rapture of Jesus. For the rapture of... For the rapture during the coming of Christ. It is a journey to the marriage of the Lamb. After her, appear, after her appearance, before the judgment set of Christ, the bride will be united to her heavenly bride's room, never to be separated from him again. The burning desire for the rapture is therefore also the expression of a desire to be at the marriage feast of the Lamb in his ivory palace, and to be lead the king in a spotless garment woven with gold. Psalm chapter 45, prepared as bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21 2. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that is but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Who is Antichrist? How to identify him? He is the major threat to Christianity. He is an arch enemy of Christianity. Scripture teaches Antichrist to be a political, religious individual yet to come in the future as of this Bible insight who is supposed to be God and God's Christ and God's Church. Although the only places in Scripture the name Antichrist is used are 1st and 2nd John, 1st John 2.18, 22, 1st John chapter 4, verse 3, 2nd John chapter 7. The Bible is replete with instruction regarding the reality we call Antichrist. The key passages are Daniel 7, chapter 8, chapter 11, Matthew chapter 24, 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 18, where Antichrist is referred to as a best, a little horn, a false Christ, the wicked one, and the man of sin. Antichrist is a false Christ. Antichrist's name gives us indication of what he is. He's Antichrist. As every Jew knows, the name Christ is simply the Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, whom the Jews expected to come in God's name to save them. The Messiah or Christ is the one anointed by God and qualified to carry out a certain work in God's name. Christ's work is to redeem 
God's people from sin and death by His own death. And to renew God's creation as a creation of righteousness and peace. The man Jesus of Nazareth died uh, AD 33 is this Christ. He is God anointed, the servant of Jehovah. He is qualified to do the work of redeeming God's people and renewing creation. The confession of the church down through the ages is Jesus is the Christ. Antichrist is a false Christ according to Matthew 24, 24. He claims to be anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and claims to be qualified to do the work in God's name of redeeming God's people and renewing the creation. But he is not. He's a liar. His claims are false. Is a false Christ. Antichrist opposed to Christ and to God. A little word study may help to understand the prefix anti in the name Antichrist. Just as anti-venom is given to counteract the venom of a snake bite. An antiseptic is used against infection. So Antichrist is against is opposed to Jesus Christ. This tells us this tells us the the essence of what Antichrist is is. He is opposition to God's Christ. He is opposition to Christ personally. He is against Christ's church. He is against Christ's word, Holy Scripture. Furthermore because Christ's mission is to show the name of Jehovah God to men by showing himself to them, John 17, 6, John 14, 8, and 9, and Revelation 13, 6, Antichrist is opposed to God himself. So, although the Antichrist will leave the impression that his motivating force is love, Concern for humanity and pity for the oppressed. What drives Antichrist is not love, but hatred. The one motivating force in his life is opposition to Jesus Christ, opposition to all that he stands for, and to all that stand for him. Antichrist in place of Christ. The name Antichrist also indicates substitution. Antichrist opposes Jesus in order to supplant him, to take his place for as Christ. Although the English language does not often use the prefix anti to mean substitution, it is a common use of the preposition in the Greek language. When scripture says that Jesus died for his people, one of the preposition used is anti, indicating that he died as a substitute for his people. This is the secondary meaning of the preposition anti. Antichrist purposes to be in the place of or a substitute for Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 points out how Antichrist comes as an impostor of the Christ from God and how there is a striking outward similarity between Antichrist and, and, and Christ. Will Jesus Christ be revealed someday? So will Antichrist. Will Christ be in God's temple? Antichrist will sit there also. Is, is Christ God? Antichrist will claim to be. Did Christ support his claim to be God with signs and wonders? Antichrist too will perform signs and wonders. Christ is a kingdom, so will Antichrist. Christ comes by the power of the Spirit. 
Antichrist will come by the power of a spirit, who is the devil himself. Does it surprise anyone then that in the Middle Ages, Antichrist was called the, the ape of Christ? He comes in the place of Christ, making himself out to be Christ. In every way, mimicking Christ, Antichrist will propose to be Christ. Antichrist is Satan's counterpart to Christ. Jesus was God's choice to establish His kingdom, redeem His people, renew creation. Antichrist is Satan's choice to establish His kingdom, gather in as many people as He can, and subject all to Himself. All of God's plan hinges on the works of Jesus the Christ. All of Satan's plan hinge on the working and success of Antichrist. Antichrist as an individual person. Although there is difference of opinion among reform students of scripture regarding this, it, it is not difficult to see why many believe that Antichrist will be one man. A reality that stands opposed to Jesus, but also that claims to be the Christ, the anointed of God, must be a man as Christ was a man, a man in whom the put their trust, a man to whom the people can look for deliverance from their miseries. How can something claim to be Jesus, the man, and not be a man himself? Supporting this logic, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 seems to make this plain. Antichrist is that man of sin and the son of perdition. Verse 3, he shows himself that he is God. Verse 4, he is the wicked one. Verse 8, Antichrist will be a definite individual, a particular human being. A single individual of outstanding ability and extraordinary power will arise, who is opposed to Jesus Christ and claims to be the Christ. It is significant that Antichrist will be a man. Antichrist will not be the some uh, will be will not be some strange creature, unrecognizable to you and me, some foreigner, a man from Mars or another solar system. Antichrist will not be a stranger to humanity. Indeed, he will be the final and full development of man of the human race. You will know him well, for his nature will be your nature. Man always has and always will claim equality and identity with God. Witness the insane ravings of the Shirley MacLeans and others today. This man's claims will be believable. He will be one of us. Antichrist, a political power. Revelation 13 gave further instruction about Antichrist, teaching that his kingdom will be both a political and an ecclesiastical empire. The vision of Revelation 13 must be read in the light of Revelation 12, where the dragon cast out of heaven identified as the devil and Satan, pursues the woman who represent the church of Christ in the new dispensation. The dragon is angry because the woman's man-child, Jesus Christ, is caught up into heaven before the dragon can devour him. Now he spits his poisonous black bile on the woman, persecuting her, making war with her seed. He hates and tries to devastate the church. Chapter 13, we have the appearance of two best, which are the product of the dragon in chapter 12, his creation and servant. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Verse 3, this first best is a wild animal which arises out of the sea. It looks like a leopard. But its feet are like bear's feet, and its mouth like a lion's. 
Its seven heads and ten horns make us think of the dragon himself in chapter uh, 12, verse 3 in the book of Revelation, where he was pictured with seven heads and ten horns. The heads of the best are full of blasphemy, and one of the heads has a scar from a wound now held. After the best has risen from the sea, the whole world worship, worships this best while it's, it spews out blasphemies against God and makes war with the saints and overcomes them. This is the same beast that Revelation chapter 17 verse 3 refers to, where it is described as a scarlet in color, ridden by a great whore. If you study the vision in Revelation chapter 13 in connection with Daniel 7, you will see that the vision of Revelation 13 is based on that of Daniel 7, and that the best of Revelation 13 is the best of Daniel 7. Uh, John's best from the sea is a combination of the leopard, bear, lion, and indescribable fourth best of Daniel 7, whose ten horns give rise to one horn that speaks great, boastful things, and makes war with the saints and prevails. What does this beast from the sea represent? Antichrist. But Antichrist is a world government, a political power, the likes of which this world has never seen. The origin of this best is the sea, which represent the restless nations and peoples of the earth. Isaiah 57.20 teaches, The wicked, unlike the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt, if more is needed, Revelation 17 tells us that the waters which thou sowest, where the whole city are peoples and multitudes and nations. Little doubt is left when we see that the best has horns and crowns. In the scripture, horns are symbolic of power and crowns of ruling authority. Besides, Revelation 13 2 says that the best has power and a throne and great authority. And verse 7 says that he has power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. If any question remains, Daniel 7 says that the four best are four kings. And Revelation 17 says the best from the earth is a king. The centuries of division and separation on this earth will end in a one world government. The Antichrist is a political reality, a new world order, a global unity. We emphasize the point in the preceding paragraph because there is often the impression that Antichrist will simply be a religious figure. Scripture makes clear, however, that Antichrist will be a political power. This political power will be a worldwide power. The best has ten horns and ten crowns, representing fullness of power and authority over the nations of the world. Verse 3 says that all the world wandered after the best. Verse 7 says that he has power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And verse 8 says that all that dwell on the earth shall worship him. All, of course, except those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. But it is a one worldwide power that is the goal of and an embodiment of all previous world powers. This is brought out in Revelation 13 in two ways. Follow along carefully as we look at this important point. First, the best of Revelation 17 has the characteristic of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. So that even though uh, it is the final development of Daniel 7's fourth best, it somehow embodies the other three as well. The four best of Daniel 7 almost all agree represent four great world kingdoms. Babylon, headed by Nebuchadnezzar, the Medes and Persians, led by Cyrus, 
Greece and Macedonia under Alexander the Great, and finally Rome. The best of Revelation 13 is the final development of the old Roman kingdom, which indicates that Antichrist will come out of the Christian West and not the pagan East. But it takes into self, it, uh, but it takes into itself also the other great kingdoms. Secondly, the Antichrist is a worldwide kingdom. It's also the meaning of the seven heads of the best described in Revelation 17. The seven heads of the best are seven kingdoms. Five of them had already fallen. One of them was still standing. At the same time, John wrote this prophecy about 1895 and one yet to come. Rome was the kingdom in existence and the one yet to come is the anti-Christian kingdom. The five which have already passed out of existence were the Greek kingdom, the Middle Persian, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, and the kingdom of Babel, headed by Nimrod. We say, therefore, one best with seven heads, and now the Spirit teaches us that uh, the great kingdom of Antichrist, as the embodiment of this former kingdom, succeeds where the other kingdoms ultimately failed, achieving its goal of world dominance. Nations cease their war warring, the planet is united, the world is one, and the world belongs to Antichrist. This healing of the one in Revelation 13 points to the success of Antichrist. We must not fail to see the significance of the healing of the wound. One of the heads of this best had a deadly wound that was held. The explanation of this is that in the time of Nimrod, at the Tower of Babel, there was an attempt to unite all men into one great world power. God frustrated this attempt by dividing the men and women into different races with different colors and languages so that they were forced to separate. Races have remained separate ever since. All their efforts to be united have been frustrated up to this point. At the end, Antichrist will succeed. This, we believe, is what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of when it says, He who, ha who, 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 now, he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. That is, he that restrain it will restrain. There is something or someone that restrain, hinders, impedes the Antichrist from coming. But in the end, that hindrance will be taken out of the way so that the Antichrist can succeed in uniting all the kingdoms and nations of the world into one. One must be blind and deaf not to detect this happening today. In a way that has never happened before, that was impossible before, nations are holding hands and talking peace. Walls are coming down. Economies are becoming more and more interdependent. The union of all the world into one is on the horizon. One day soon the sun will rise on a united world and Antichrist will be its bright and morning star. Antichrist as an ecclesiastical power. But Antichrist is not only a beast from the sea. The second part of the vision in Revelation 13, Father reveals him as another beast, one arising from the earth. This beast serves the first beast, wielding the power of the first beast making all the words worship the first beast and showing that without it, the first beast is nothing. And the point of the vision is that the reality of Antichrist is two cooperating powers, the one political, the other ecclesiastical. The beast that arises out of the earth looks like a lamb. It had two horns of a lamb. But it was a beast. So immediately we understand the nature of this beast. It is a deceptive creature a ferocious 
best disguised as a Jinto lamb. The horror is that this best masquerades as Jesus Christ, who is the lamp of God. This best too is powerful, for it is has horn, for it has horns. However, the power of this best is not political or military. Rather, it is, its power is the power of persuasive speech. It speaks like a dragon, persuading the world to worship the first beast, to build an image of the first beast, and to bow down to it. It is plain that this beast represents false religion. Preaching and teaching make men worship something or someone. But this is false teaching and lying preaching. That's evident from the fact that this beast looks like a lamb, looks like Jesus Christ and all that Jesus Christ represents, but in actuality is a best. He claims to speak like Jesus, but has the foul breath and fiery speech in the eyes and nostrils of God of a dragon. This best will not arise from Hinduism or Buddhism or any other pagan religion. He will arise out of Christianity itself. Few Christians would believe a Gandhi's claim to be Christ. When one looks at Revelation 19.20 that become obvious, there in the passage that describes the defeat of Antichrist, we read, we read that the best was taken and with him false, the false prophet that worked miracles before the best. The second best represents false Christianity, the apostate church that calls itself that in the church of Christ. We mean by this designation the broad church and do not intend it to be confused with a certain denomination of that name. The work of the second best is the service of the first, the cooperating with the anti-Christian world government. What is that service? It is causing all the world to worship the first beast. It will call all men and women of the world to bow down to the first beast, who is the savior of the world. And now the prophecy of Revelation 17 comes to pass. The kings of the earth commit, commit fornication with the whore, the false church. If one asks what he should look for in the days to come, we say this. There will be political union. All nations will be gathered together into one mighty empire. This is the first beast. There will also be religious union joining all the religions and religious empires of the world. The powerful ecumenical movement of today, led by the religions of Christianity, will in the end fully succeed, swallowing up all the other religions of the world. You may expect to see one man over it all, Antichrist. Antichrist Purpose why in the world would anyone work such deceitful effrontery? Why such effort in a sham kingdom? Why would any man with that kind of worldwide sovereignty even want his kingdom identified with Christ, labeled in the name of God? To ask these questions is to answer them. Antichrist's purpose is to destroy the saints. God's elect. And here we get to the heart of the matter. The man Antichrist, the man Antichrist indwelt by Satan's spirit, is opposed to God and opposed to Jesus Christ. With a hatred that can be traced back to the fall of the angels prior to Genesis 3, he despises God and God's cause in Jesus. But he cannot touch God because God cast him out of heaven, according to Revelation chapter 12. And he cannot touch God's Christ because Jesus was caught up into heaven. So the only thing that remains for him to do is to breath his fire on the seed of the woman, the church of Christ. Revelation chapter 12 describes this church as the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 24, 
they are described as the elect of God. The devil knows that to attack to attack the church is to attack Jesus, the Christ, and to do damage to the body of Christ is to inflict damage upon Christ. He also knows that because the members of the church are the chosen of God, eternally loved by God, Deuteronomy 7, 6, 8, to destroy them is equivalent to defeating God. So the objects of His fury are the beloved of God. He desires to have you who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the elect of God. And if that is true, you must know how He works. You must understand His methods. Antichrist methods. Antichrist goes about his business by speaking the lie. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says that he comes with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Revelation 13.2 says, And he spoke as a dragon. Revelation 17 tells us that he was a false prophet. A prophet being one who is calling it, it is to speak and to teach. The armies of the world may have guns and tanks and bombs to bring people into submission. But the power of speech and ideas is a mighty power. In his initial attempts to destroy the cause of God, the devil used a serpent to deceive the woman with a crooked speech. You will be like God. Now he uses a dragon who speaks crafty, lying words. His speeches will be heard by millions who will hang on his persuasive rhetoric. The content as well as the form of his speech will attract. Like most more false prophets, he will even be sincere and passionate. But he is a liar. He adds dashes of truth to the mix so that his lie tastes like truth. He will be used, he will use all the right catchwords using the language of the church, even throwing in a Bible text or two. But he is the ultimate liar and will deceive many. He will use every tool available, school teachers, politicians, news broadcasters, artists, musicians, scientists, and doctors, lawyers, and businessmen. All will be pressed into the service of Antichrist to, to deceive men. But especially he will use those whose calling it is to persuade and to teach men who claim to be preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is this message that has such power to deceive? What is it that is preached by the now apostate churches once rooted in true Christianity that stirs up mankind to this, to this ecumenical worship? What gospel will attract the hordes of men and women? What good news will knit the souls of such diverse peoples and nations and tongues? The gospel of Antichrist is humanism, the happiness of man, the glory of man, the peace and prosperity, the health and wealth of man. The number of the best, do not forget, is 666, the number of man. But we remind you, the Antichrist deceives. He will not tip his hand by declaring publicly, I am the Antichrist. He will not claim that there is no God, no Christ, no salvation, and that the message of the Bible is a lie. But he will say, I am your Messiah. You are God, like Shirley MacLean, as comrades can consort in the Rastafarians of Jamaica, whose word for divine is AI vine and an earthly life of peace and prosperity, of health and happiness, that is salvation. The distant rumblings of Antichrist thunder are growing louder. 
performing miracles, Antichrist will establish himself and validate his claim as God's unwinted. This is the emphasis of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Men have always performed miracles to establish their authority, presenting them as the credentials of their divine appointment. Moses did in Egypt. Elijah did on Mount Carmel. Jesus Christ and his apostles did. So will Antichrist. Revelation 13.13 says that the second best doeth great wonders and verse 14 that he will deceive it them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the best. Matthew 24.24 indicates the same thing. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall grow and shall Show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. This is the teachings of Second Thessalonians 2:9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, the works of Antichrist will be the works of Satan, who has the power beyond the natural ability. of man. Nor will this be fake miracles. This will not be just magic tricks of talented men like Harry Houdini and David Copperfield, but amazing deeds that simply defy explanation in human scientific terms. But tracing the claims of Antichrist will be nothing less than the superhuman power of the devil himself. The church calling oppose Antichrist presently. The critical danger of for the church today is exactly the reality, the reality called Antichrist. That the critical danger for the church today is exactly the reality called Antichrist. There is a danger that the church As it were, post a lookout to scan the horizon for Antichrist, so that the lookout can warn the people of God when the enemy has arrived and sound the warning to give battle. In the meantime, the church is busy with its own legitimate work, but supposes that the Antichrist is of no danger presently. That is precisely what Antichrist wants the church to believe. God's call to His people is to oppose the Antichrist now. We are not saying here that the Christian's calling is to be ready to oppose Antichrist when He comes, urgent as that calling is. We are saying that our calling and the calling that we urge you to carry out is this, oppose the opposer of Jesus Christ presently, not someday, but today. Oppose the opposer of Jesus Christ presently, not someday, but today. It is possible to oppose him now, for he is present now. Before you race ahead to find us naming names or identifying persons and churches, let us explain. First John to Eden does not say, Antichrist shall come, but Antichrist comes. That is, There is a process of Antichrist coming all down through the history of this world. This process involves the coming of many Antichrist in the plural. Thus, Matthew 24 can warn of false Christ and can say that many shall come in Jesus' name saying, I am Christ. This also explains how Paul can say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the mystery of iniquity is working. Even as Paul wrote that later, the mystery of iniquity was active in the world, preparing the way for the final Antichrist and his work. Recognizing Antichrist spirit. Even in the old dispensation, there were Antichrist, like 
Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, Antiochus, Epiphanes, and others. But especially in the New Testament, since Christ's ascension, Antichrist has been coming. The great anti-Christian kingdom with its mighty head with, will not appear ex nihilo out of nothing but it will be the but will be the result of a long and gradual development and that long and gradual development is and has been the work of the spirit of antichrist the spirit of satan himself laying the groundwork preparing the way making ready for the revelation of the man of sin the son of perdition was it wrong then of the reformers to say that the pope was antichrist if the reformers meant that the pope at the time pope saint paul the third or another was the personal antichrist the man of sin the final culmination of the devil's work in this world they were mistaken he did not complete the picture the scripture draws but one may not dismiss the reformers as well, wild, wild eyed fanatics. Consider the Pope is and was also a political figure. That is no less plain today than it that it was in Luther's day. Then already the Pope laid claim to the right to strong to crown kings and invest them with the authority to, to rule the world. Today, the Vatican has its ambassadors in almost every nation of the world, and even we, and even. Uh, in the United States, sent our send own representatives to the Pope. The Pope is a political head. Rome has always embodied the anti-Christian spirit and principles. A headship that is in, ma in a man, a Pope, a hierarchy, an authority of tradition, in addition to the one word of God, a salvation by works in addition to faith and grace, a worship of another Mary in addition to the worship of the one alone in whose, in whose name was we find salvation. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. The struggle of the people of God against Antichrist has always been and will always be a present struggle. The call to oppose Antichrist must always be given in the present imperative. Whether in the future, the church children, your children and my children are able to withstand the man of sin, the son of perdition. Depends to a great degree on the success of the battle we wage against his spirit today. The second best is working his labor is underway. We are not re referring to specific persons or particular it is institutions and churches we are referring to the spirit of our age that rejects God and God's word and promotes with all of its power man the purpose of education today is man's welfare the purpose of science is man's pleasure the goal of entertainment is the good life for man hedonism says it all the world is crowded with anti Antichrist presently. Now, look not only on the horizon for Antichrist. Look about you. Oppose him today. We do not oppose him with guns and tanks and bombs. We do not try to prevent his coming or overthrow it when it comes, when it comes by political power plays. We oppose him in a spiritual manner. In the same way Jesus Christ opposed him during his ministry and in the way Jesus taught his disciples to oppose him in theirs by faith and the powerful word of the gospel. We oppose all the opposes Jesus Christ. We oppose humanism that exalts man and promotes the cause of man and man alone. That is why reformed believers from the beginning have maintained that it is necessary for them to maintain good Christian schools in which their children are educated. The world inculcates its young with humanistic values and humanistic goals, and we must have no part of that miseducation. We oppose humanism from the pulpit of our churches 
and put out those ministers and elders who would preach and teach this kind of a gospel. In this way, we oppose Antichrist today. We oppose hierarchical church government. Hierarchy in the church, the role by a few holy ones or by an intellectual elite from the top down is anti-Christian spirit and purpose. That is one main reason the reformers were opposed to the Pope. Audaciously, he set himself up as a vicar of Christ, head of the church, whose word no priest or bishop or council much, much, much least layman could question. We oppose Antichrist today by opposing hierarchy, a lordship of man, a sitting aside of the word of God and the replacing of it with the word and will of man. We oppose the ecumenical mania rife today in the churches. There are powerful winds blowing hurricane hurricane force winds blowing across the churches to bring them together into one large, large church body. Robert Scholar, world acclaimed pastor of one of the largest reformed churches in America, calls the church world, it's time for Protestant to go to the shepherd or poop and say, what do we have to do to come home? It is found in Los Angeles, Herald Examiner, September 19, 1997. The bottom line, the common denominator that summons all together is the goal of a world in which man will have earthly peace and prosperity. It seems that the only heresy in the minds of church, most churchmen today is the questioning of the ecumenical movement. There is even a widespread notion abroad showing itself also in reform circles that all the pagan religions are legitimate, nothing other than the expression of the universal religious feelings of mankind that probably find their best expressions in Christianity. Witness that the Protestant preachers praying with Muslims. The basis for that is humanism. The Church of Christ today opposes Antichrist by giving battle to those notions and ideas prevalent in the church today. We oppose Antichrist by opposing all heresy in the church. Heresy or false doctrine is nothing less than the opposition to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. How often does not Jesus warn his disciples of those wolves in sheep, wolves who will misrepresent the truth to draw men away from, God, from Jesus? But how much concern is there today for fighting heresy, exposing false doctrine for what it is, anti-Christian spirit and purpose, paving the way for the man of sin himself who will re deceive many? Opposing heresy, we promote the truth. The people of God who have a heart for God's Christ and Christ's church take the offensive in this battle against Antichrist. Promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. I repeat, promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Promote biblical church government. Promote the proper Presbyterian form of church government. Promote the proper manner of church union and reunion on the basis of the truth of the gospel of God. Finally, we do battle with Antichrist in ourselves. For Antichrist as an ally in my own sinful nature. Here is humanism in its basic form, in my own heart. Here is the false doctrine of salvation by the works of man right here in my own proud breast. Here is hierarchy, the role by a few, by me. Right here in my own heart, I find sympathy with the notion that salvation comes by faith and by works in myself is the lie in its crudest form ye shall be as God when the saint fights antichrist in his heart with his heart God will give him the strength to oppose antichrist when he is revealed in the last day at the end of which he will be destroyed utterly and completely I repeat when the saint fights Antichrist in his heart, with his heart, God will give him the strength to oppose Antichrist when he is revealed in the last day, at the end 
of which you will be destroyed utterly and completely. Antichrist is your enemy, is my enemy. Antichrist is the major and greatest enemy of Christianity, of Christian belief, of true Christian believers, of true Christian doctrine and beliefs. Antichrist is the greatest enemy of Jesus Christ teaching doctrines and Antichrist is the greatest enemy of our solid biblical divine faith. We must believe and always believe that true Jesus Christ reject, ignore, and fight against Antichrist from this day onward. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.